and we're back with story time in my new book, Light of the Infinite. This is the Exodus of Illumination. This is the third book for Vayikra, which this chapter is called Spiritualized Reality. So we're going to jump in. There was a time when I stopped visiting Israel because it was too difficult for me to go back there after my safta, my grandmother, passed away. Her house had always been the first stop. I would run there directly from Ben Gurion Airport. She would likely have some Yemenite food and mind-blowing schnitzel awaiting for my arrival. Back when I was in Yeshiva and lived in Yerushalayim, I would take my friends to my saftas in Ramat Gan, which is outside of Tel Aviv, for Shabbatot. They all called her Jima. I remember her waking up at 5 a.m. every day, covering her hair and saying the morning prayers. She would cook Yemenite food, Moroccan salads, My friends and I would sing Shabbat songs in Hebrew as she sat on the couch crying from happiness. It's incredible to realize all the time that she and her family were exiled in Yemen and Ethiopia, but eventually they were able to come back to Israel and she could see her grandson living in Yerushalayim in Jerusalem, singing the songs that have been sung throughout history every Shabbat since the Jews left Egypt. She made it. We made it. The yearning for home and the unification of a people with its ancestral homeland was realized in her lifetime. Yemenite Jews are unique in that they are the strongest link to the Beit HaMikdash, to the Holy Temple. They settled in Yemen while the temple still stood and have maintained their Hebrew pronunciations and Jewish practices in completely a unique way, whereas all the other Jews have mostly been moved around and some kicked out of various countries immigrating to different countries, assimilating along the way. Yemenite Jews, Melech Shlomo, King, King Solomon, had sent them to Yemen between the two Beit HaMikdashes, between the two holy temples, and they had stayed there. Up until now, I think there's one left in Sana. But my family moved. My grandfather, once he heard there was a Jew that was elected or in, in a position of power with the British, he had moved, I think it was in 1929, and he had said, if that's the case, then Mashiach is coming. And he packed his bags and literally like the next day he went from Yemen and started to make his way towards Israel. And my, my grandparents were living in Ramat Gan. So whereas most every other Jewish tribe has traveled and assimilated into larger cr- cultures around them, Yemenite Jews have stayed in Yemen up until the last hundreds or so years. Even the greatest Eastern European Kadol Viposa Kador, which is this Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who's recognized both from the Ashkenazic and the Sephardic traditions, said that the Yemenite Jews' pronunciation of Hebrew is the closest to that of Moshe Rabbeinu, of Moses. Now to this Torah portion, which is Vayikra, which is the first Torah portion in the third book of the five books of Moses of the Torah. And it centers around the Beit HaMikdash, this holy temple, and its practices, and how these pertain to our life. The Hebrew word Kabbalah means parallel or correspondence. Kabbalah is the mystical teaching of the parallels and correspondences between all of creation and the divine power that creates it. The structures of the four letters of the divine name, the Havaya, the Shem Havaya, the Tetragrammaton, the Yudke Vavke, express the creative force that sustains and is manifest in all the levels of reality. We explored this notion in Vayakel, in that Torah portion, when we spoke about the parallels between Hashem, between God's arousal from above, and our arousal from below. This was illustrated two millennia ago in the sacrificial rituals of the Holy Temple, the Beit HaMikdash, both of them. The Temple is a microcosm of the creation, and all the rituals performed in it are both symbolic of and actualizations of the divine service each of us is tasked with in the physical world. Now, Rizal explains that Hashem, that God created five kingdoms in our physical world. The silent, meaning the inanimate or mineral, the vegetable, the animal, the articulate, meaning humans, and finally the soul. Each of these is a world unto itself, and each is also a projection of the one that precedes it at a lower spiritual level. This structure of the physical world reflects the structure of the highest spiritual realm, Atzilut, a world of pure emanation. In the process of creating all the worlds below Atzilut, a shattering happened. Out of tohu, chaos, 
came divine sparks which infuse themselves within all aspects of reality in all the lower worlds, including the lowest, which is our physical world, which is our reality, this, this world. Kabbalah explains that the other fundamental aspects of the creation of the world is tikkun, meaning rectification or repair. When we use any element of our physical world for a divine purpose, we elevate that spark within it to its holy source, turning the physical back into the spiritual. And I heard this president-elect a few months ago. I, now I feel like I should add this to, to this chapter. But he was breaking down the word repair and highlighting that it is repair. It's like pairing of this thing again. So that works really well in this concept of the brachot or elevating something that is kind of separated and we're bringing it back to its source. Now that we have a bit of Kabbalistic background, we could jump into the actual words of the chapters in this parasha, Vayikra, in this Torah portion. The portion begins, when one among you offers a sacrifice to God, immediately we ask what sort of sacrifice, why and how. King David whose son built the first temple, writes in Telium, for you, God, do not desire sacrifices, else I would give it. You did not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Animal sacri- sacrifices were a way for ancient Jews to elevate themselves spiritually, but the sacrifices would have been meaningless if they weren't done with true intention and a full heart to heal oneself and the harm one has done. King David writes that God will not despise a broken spirit because true remorse makes a person feel broken. And true repentance comes from the desire to be connected to Hashem, to God again, in order to be whole. In order to achieve this level of return, this teshuvah, we were commanded to bring a sacrifice in the time of the temple, just as we are now commanded to pray in the absence of the temple. The Hebrew word for sacrifice is korban, which comes from the word karov or lekarev, which means close or to come closer. It's written in the pasuk, michem, which means yourself, implying the one who is offering the korban is sacrificing themselves. I love how Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs puts it. So this is a quote from one of his books. Vayikra is about why love needs law and law needs love. It is about the quotidian act of devotion to bring two beings close, even when one of them is vaster than the universe and the other is of mortal of flesh and blood. It is about being human, sinning, falling short, always conscious of our fragile hold on life, yet seeking to come close to God and what is sometimes harder, allowing him to come close to us. In the last chapter, which was my second book, The Exit of Darkness, we discussed God's dwelling in the sanctuary representing the deeper dwelling amongst each and every one of us. In this Torah portion, the Torah teaches how the holy priests are guided in their service and sacrifice in the sanctuary of the past. The korbanot, these sacrifices, are a beautiful and spiritual ritual. Picture the elements surrounding the sacrifice with the presence of the kohanim, the priests, accompanied by the chanting and songs of the Levi'im, the Levites. The Zohar teaches that the service of the kohanim was in silence, with the devotion of the heart, signifying hamshacha, drawing forth from above. While the service of the Levi'im, the Levites, was with song and music, signifying halaah, sublimation, elevating from below upwards. As it's written, the Kohanim, the priest in their silent service, and their desire drew God's presence downward, and the Levites in their songs and praises drew the human soul and sacrifice upwards. This is mirrored in how we tend to the sanctuaries within our own souls. The inner acts of sacrifice we practice each day, the desire we have to bring holiness down from above, and the artfulness we use to draw our spirits and surroundings upwards. So just for those that just joined now, this is my third book. We're just jumping in because we're jumping into the third book of the Torah, uh, the third book of the five books of Moses. So this is Light of the Infinite. And this one's called The Sound of Illumination. You can see it says number three. So Vayikra, that we're in now, lists a variety of korbanot, of sacrifices, to be brought by individual and the community. Below are some general categories. So Ola, burnt offering, you've probably heard, an animal sacrifice that is completely burnt upon the altar. Mincha, meal offering, an offering of fine flour, oil, and frankincense. Shlamim, 
peace offering, shlamim, a fire offering of the fats and kidneys of an animal. The other parts are given to the Kohen, and the remainder is eaten by the owner. Chatat, sin offering, the blood of the animal is poured upon the altar, and the fats are also burnt. The rest is eaten by the Kohanim, the, the priests. Asham, guilt offering, depending on the individual's means, this offering may be either an animal from the flock, two doves, or fine flour. Miluim, inauguration offering, an offering brought by a Kohen, which he joins the service in the Beit HaMikdash. Korban Toda, Thanksgiving offering, an animal sacrifice brought together with four different types of bread. Some parts of the animals are burnt upon the altar. Others were given to the Kohen, and the remainder is eaten by the owner. Korban Tamid, daily sacrifice, every morning and afternoon, the Kohanim in the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the sacred sanctuary, and later in the Beit HaMikdash, brought a fire offering of a year a yearling lamb together with the fine flour and oil. Ketoet, incense offering, and this one's super deep. We've talked about it when we were learning Likute Maran, and maybe we'll go into it a bit later. An offering of 11 finely ground spices, which were burnt upon the golden altar in the inner sanctuary next to the Holy of Holies. There are two concrete ways in which we could, to some extent, simulate bringing a korban, a sacrifice. In, now, in Talmud Menachot, it teaches in the Gemara, based on this is the law of the sin of the offering, that anyone who engages in studying the law of the sin offering as ascribed credit as though they had sacrificed a sin offering, as though they had given it. Aside from learning laws, there is a custom to recite Pashata Kaubanot, the this portion of the sacrifices as a part of our daily tefillah, of our prayers, specifically saying, if I'm obliged to bring a sin offering or any other korban, may it be your will that the recitation of the portion dealing with chatat should be considered as if I brought the sin offering. The Alter Rebbe, who, I guess I'm wearing my Breslov jacket now, but who inspires me every day, I try to learn Tanya every day, and that's the book of the in-betweeners written by the Alter Rebbe, who's also known as the Balatanya, breaks down this pasuk, this verse, if a man desires to draw close to divinity, then mikem korban Lashem, you must offer of yourself. The word mikem, or mikem, signifies the offering of the nefesh elokit, of our divine soul. And further in the pasuk, in the verse, the phrase of the animals signifies the animal in man's heart, the nefesh habemit, the animal soul from the animal within one's base characteristics. The Lubavitch Rebbe expounds on this lesson, explaining that the ultimate purpose for a person is not an avodah, service relating to the divine soul for its own sake, but rather to achieve a birul, a refinement of the animal soul, which we see in the word michem, of you, followed by korban la Hashem, an offering to God. We see in the sentence, if any man brings an offering of you to draw close to God, one must make a sacrifice of you, of oneself. So you is the essential element of a holy sacrifice. From the heart, from one's godly soul, turning good intention into action. And that's why Melech David, why King David is saying that, telling God that you don't desire these burnt offerings of animals and all these things. It's the broken spirit. It's this constant ups and downs. And when we're in those downs, realizing that that God willing will be the thing that pushes up us back toward the up and back towards the elevation and the alignment and all of these things. So this sacrifice is moving through this and realizing that that's part of reality. There's always the yirida, which is the descent, but then comes the ascent, then comes the aliyah. And the idea of the redemptive state is realizing this and eventually staying in, even when things are hard, staying in this redemptive state and realizing that these things can coexist. And Zohar, in the Zohar of Shimon Bar Yochai, also talks about this. And as we just were, you know, in the book, covered this paragraph on the animal soul and the godly soul. So in the Zohar, it's saying that you actually could sort of have both of these things happen simultaneously, meaning there could be bad things happening and that could be connected to the animal soul. So, and I was just speaking with someone who was like, it sounded like they're putting their life on hold because they're going through a divorce and, and you know, there's all these other struggles I'm not going to get into because I don't want to 
get into someone's personal business. But it was like, okay, I could eventually be happy and move on with my life once all of these things happen, these bad things, these dark things, these difficult things. But what we have to realize is you, both of those things can coexist. Something bad could be happening, something difficult and darkness can be happening. And those could be tied to this finite space, this exile, this space of disconnect and darkness. But at the same time, we can exist in the light. We can exist and connect ourselves to the spiritual, to the infinite, to the light, and realize that we can choose to continuously take that faithful step into that space of light and alignment, even when these difficult things are happening. The words from the heart mean that the person has to bring the sacrifice willingly. It's the same with tefillah, with prayer. We should pray out of love, not obligation. The same applies with lending money and other matters between man and his fellow, which are meant to be performed willingly and even bisimcha with joy. The Bartanura comments on Talmud Avot, the Gemara, regarding giving tzedakah, giving charity. If someone were to do it with their face pressed to the ground under duress, it would be as though the person didn't give the tzedakah, the, the charity at all. The person will still receive a reward for the mitzvah, for the commandment, but in a sense, it's as though the person didn't perform the act because they did it purely out of obligation instead of willingly and lovingly. It reminds me of this Isha Ribo song that, I mean, it's in Hebrew, but in English, he's basically saying like, if you're going to give, you may as well give it from the heart. And that's, that's with everything. You know, when there's a whole story of this poor person who got this pidyon, this person was donating this money. And I guess he could sense he wasn't giving it from the heart and he ended up giving it back. And somebody had asked him like, I don't understand. This is exactly what you need. You were praying for this. How could you give it back? How could you not just take it? This is, it was just like dumbfounded. And he said, if you had saw the glee with which this person had taken the money back, you also wouldn't have taken it. And it's that, it's this idea that anything you do, you're doing anyway, and you should do with love. And you can literally inspire other people from that act, but it's also you putting yourself in this space of love so that you're emanating that and it keep, keeps going because if the world's recreated every moment, then you could choose that at that moment. And if you keep choosing it, then that's the space and the reality that you exist in. The second part of the Pasuk verse pertains to an animal sacrifice, meaning one's animal soul. As it's written, from animals, from cattle or from the flock, shall you bring your offering. This relates to the physical body, physical desires, the natural world. So it is the physical sacrifice actually giving up the animal or its modern equivalent with the purpose to sanctify and redirect the animal in man. The Rebbe explains that when the animal in man is harnessed in the service of God, it has the power to take him closer to God than his godly soul alone could reach. The greater the sacrifice, the greater reward. And this is this whole idea of when we think about Yaakov and Esav, Esav, Esau representing the animal soul and Yaakov represent or Jacob representing the godly soul and then eventually being named Israel, the redemptive state, the promised land. And Esau in this reality and his temptations and all the lusts and everything, he chooses to go the other direction and connect to the Yitzhara and just the physical things in life and lusts and all that. But the thing is, because He's connected to the animal soul. And because you can, if you can flip that Yitzhara, which is the evil inclination in the animal soul to good, then it almost has more strength than the godly soul. But the idea is to align them so that your animal soul becomes subservient and a conduit for the godly soul. And that's that's what we're talking about here. Rab Natan of Breslov, Rabbi Nachman's foremost I, I always hesitate to say student because he became one of the greatest of all time. But his student, let's say, teaches that a person's sin is due to their lack of dot, awareness. As it's written, a person's sin or a person sins only because of the spirit of foolishness overcame them. To rectify this lack of dot, the person must bring an animal sacrifice, which reflects that lack. In this way, the person demonstrates their readiness to sacrifice their animalistic tendencies. We learn that the animal sacrifices in particular have the power to rectify the lowest worlds. 
And that the korbanot, the sacrifice in general, correspond to the act of creation when Hashem, when God separated good from bad. In the same way, the korban, or the korbanot, the sacrifices, separate good from evil. In the same way that, the, that any animal that is to become a korban, a sacrifice, cannot have a blemish, we are tasked with not having blemishes in regard to the animal within ourselves. This is done through self-examination and true remorse. Searching one's soul for rifts in the unity of one's being. This includes the three soul garments of thought, speech, and deed. If a kosher animal was torn apart by a predator, it would then be deemed unkosher, treif, which literally means torn. Unlike an animal deemed treif, however, we are able to do full repentance, which in Hebrew is called teshuva, meaning return. We are never completely torn away from God. This parasha, this Torah portion, teaches us the process of taking the sitra achra, the fallen sparks, that which opposes godliness, the other side, and elevating them into the light, supplementing the darkness. But this can only be done through both our inclinations, for the good and for evil. This is the meaning of the famous passage, and you shall love the eternal, your God, with all of your heart. Our most profound sacrifice is when we subdue and harness the overwhelming power of the evil inclination and manage to use that energy for the highest good in divine service. The Zohar states this clearly. When the Sitra Akra, the other side, is subdued below in our lowest world, the Holy One, blessed be He, is exalted above and is aggrandized in His glory. In fact, there is no worship of God except when it issues forth from darkness and no good except when it proceeds from evil. The perfection of all things is attained when intermingled good and evil become totally good. For there is no good except if it issues out of evil. By that good, his glory rises. And that is the perfect worship. This is seen in the parable of the harlot, in which a king instructs his son to lead an exemplary and moral life and not to fall into temptation. Meanwhile, the king secretly tasks a temptress to seduce his son, thereby testing his son's devotion to him. The woman tries everything to seduce the prince, but he rejects all attempts. At this, his father, the king, rejoices and bestows all his honor and great, greatest gifts to his son, the prince. The Zohar means to illustrate that all the glory due to the prince was brought about by the temptress. Surely she is to be praised on all accounts, for firstly, she fulfilled the king's command, and secondly, she caused the son to receive all that good and led to that intense love of the king for his son. Conquering the evil within ourselves demonstrates our truest devotion to the infinite. As we read, or as you read through the parasha, you will notice, and that's the Torah portion, you will notice that the sacrifices are meant to create an aroma that is pleasing to God. Not only must each person bring the sacrifice to God, to Hashem, with a full heart, but each slaughtered animal must be fit to be sacrificed so that it is pleasing to the Holy One. As above, so below. When preparing and shechting an animal for us to eat, the animal must be fit, meaning kosher. The Jewish laws and rituals for this are very specific and strict. And even after the animal is slaughtered properly and in a humane way, it is still inspected to see that there are no fatal lesions on the lungs. There are all aspects of animal being fit or kosher. These are all the aspects. In regards to us being fit, we must eat as means to serve Hashem, God, being mindful of that as its purpose, meaning connecting to that and using it to elevate and give us more energy to do good. When our food is elevated into holiness, then the life it came from and our lives are elevated. Our sages teach that a person's table is like an altar. This is why on Shabbat we salt the challah just as the sacrifices are salted. Shabbat is a taste of the world to come and prayer is a taste and a mirroring of the rituals we once carried out in the temple. But if we have intention without action or action without heart, then the aroma we create is not pleasing and the sparks are not fully elevated. My prayer and blessing is that we mirror the upper realms in this physical world, that we liberate and elevate all the fallen sparks so that the world can reach its maximum spiritual potential that is pleasing on the highest level to ourselves and to Hashem, to God. So much so that the final redemption reveals itself speedily. Much love. See you next time.